Amen. For those that are visiting, last week we started our study series on 1 Samuel. And we entitled that lesson, Hope for Tomorrow, because the book overall is a demonstration of how God always has hope for people. But today's lesson is entitled, from the song, Trials Dark on Every Hand. (laughs) That's sometimes how we feel, isn't it? Remember last week in chapter 1, we talked about Hannah. And there we studied out this young wife who just was in total distress because her dream was always to have a family, to have a child. And sometimes we, we think that the only time that there is distress is when someone has sinned. And yet here we find that Hannah is allowed to go through distress by God. For a purpose. She gets so distressed, she prays to God and says, Listen, God, please give me a son. And if you give me a son, I will let Eli, the high priest, raise him. I will give him to you and to Eli. And then she has the boy named Samuel. And God uses that distress to guide his people. We talked about Eli, the, the high priest, and how he had fallen into sin and simply tolerated sin in Israel as well as his own family. And so because of the toleration of sin, God could not be with his people. And so when his people went out to battle the Philistines, they lost. And they thought, well, we'll bring out the ark of God because God is with the ark. And so they brought the ark out and then the news came on back that Israel had lost. Not just the battle, but thousands of men. Not just thousands of men, but the two sons of Eli, the judges. And then the worst news of all, the ark of God had been captured. When Eli heard this, he fell back in his chair, just overwhelmed, and literally falling back, he breaks his neck and dies. At that very moment... The wife of Phineas, one of the sons of Eli, goes into labor. And she does have a child. She herself dies. But in the midst of this pain and this distress that sin brought on, she names the boy Ichabod, which means the glory of God has departed. And that's where we left off last week. Let's get to chapter 5. In chapter 5, we read in verse 1. After the Philistines had captured the ark of God, they took it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Then they carried the ark into Dagon's temple and set it beside Dagon. Now we understand that the Philistines were a very powerful seafaring nation. Dagon is their national god. The word dag in Hebrew means fish. And so Dagon was the, so to speak, fish god. The upper part of his body was like a man, and the lower half was like a fish. And so it says in verse 3, When the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, there was Dagon fallen on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. They took Dagon and put him back in his place. But the following morning when they rose, there was Dagon falling on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. His head and his hands had been broken off and they were lying on the threshold. Only his body remained. That is why to this day, neither the priests of Dagon nor any who entered Dagon's temple at Astod stepped on the threshold. Right here, yes, God had departed from Israel because of their sin. But God's presence was still in the ark. And God was still God. Amen, church? I mean, right here, they put the God of Israel with the ark inside the temple of Dagon. And God gets upset. Because, you see, God is a jealous God. God hates idolatry. And so the next morning, when the Philistines came on into their temple... They saw the giant statue of Dagon lying face down flat 
before the ark of God. And of course their mind was, oh, some trickster human beings had come on in there and pushed down the statue. So they re-erected the statue. They waited another night. The next day they come on in. Not only is the statue lying prostrate before Jehovah God. Amen. Amen. But his hands and his head were not just broken or cut off. They were set off to the side on the threshold. And of course, we understand the head represents the intellectual mind for most of us. Amen. (laughs) And by God cutting off the head of Dagon, it shows, listen. My mind is above his mind. Amen. And by cutting off our hands, our our hands are are what makes things happen. He says, listen, this God doesn't make anything happen. It is Jehovah God that makes things happen. Amen. Amen. And so once more, God was putting into this godless, idolatrous people the fear of Jehovah God. Church, let's read on. Verse 6. The Lord's hand was heavy upon the people of Ashdod in its vicinity. He brought devastation upon them and afflicted them with tumors. Now, the Bible scholars are a little bit in debate exactly what the tumors are. The Hebrew word right here denotes the tumors that they're not just kind of bumps on our, their bodies, but they were deep, infectious tumors. Some believe it was cancer. Others believe it was goiters. But it nonetheless was hideous. The Lord's hand was heavy on the people of Ashdod in his vicinity. He brought devastation upon them, afflicted them with tumors. When the men of Ashdod saw what was happening, they said, The ark of the God of Israel must not stay here with us, because his hand is heavy upon us and upon Dagon, our God. So they called together all the rulers of the Philistines and asked them, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? They answered, Have the ark of the God of Israel moved to Gath. So they moved the ark of God to Gath. But after they moved it, the Lord's hand was against that city, Throwing it into great panic. He afflicted the people of the city, both young and old, with an outbreak of tumors. So they sent the ark of God to Ekron. As the ark of God was entering Ekron, the people of Ekron cried out, They brought the ark of the God of Israel around us to kill us and our people. So they called together all the rulers of the listing and said, Send the ark of God of Israel away. Let it go back to its own place or to kill us and our people. For death had filled the city with panic. God's hand was very heavy upon it. Those who did not die were afflicted with tumors. And an outcry of the city went up to heaven. Trials dark on every hand. And we cannot understand. That's our first point. Let me tell you something. When the fear of God is placed upon an idolatrous people, they begin to understand. Proverbs says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of of wisdom. Nothing really makes sense unless we have a fear of God. You know, idolatry can take many forms. Sometimes we think in our modern society, we have risen above idolatry. I mean, after all, we don't have a little idol underneath our bed and pull it out in the morning, bow down three times, then shove it back under and then head on off. But idolatry is is simply anything or individual that's placed above God. Idolatry can be sin. Something that we perpetually do because we love it more than God. Idolatry can be a person. A good place to be a girlfriend. It can be a husband. It can be a, a friend. Someone whom we place more credibility than the Word of God. Idolatry can be a dream. We have a passion. We have a dream. And we're going to pursue it no matter what the price is, even to our relationship with God. Idolatry could be a job. We're going to, we are going to go up in this company no matter what the schedule is in it. I am going to be the president. Idolatry is that which we go after when we do not seek Jehovah God. Interestingly enough, we find right here that not only was there a plague of tumors that were hideous on the bodies of the people, and they were dying from these tumors, but also there came a plague of rats that hit their harvest. And so 
the people of Philistia go to their leaders and say, Listen, get rid of the God of Israel. Send him on back to Israel. And so we pick up the reading in verse 13, chapter 6. Now the people of Beth Shemesh were harvesting their feet in the valley. And when they looked up, they saw the ark. And they rejoiced at the sight. I mean, here are the Israelites. The ark of God has been gone for about seven months. And they are fired up. The ark of God is coming back. God is coming back to Israel. Remember now, they are still under Philistine occupation. Amen. The cart came to the field of Joshua, Beth Shemesh. And there it stopped beside a large rock. The people chopped up the wood of the cart and sacrificed the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. The Levites took down the ark of the Lord together with the chest containing the gold objects and placed them on the large rock. On that day, the people of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and made sacrifices to the Lord. The five rulers of Philistines saw all this and then returned the same day to Ekron. What they had done in sending back the ark in representation of the five cities that the hand of God was heavy upon, the five key Philistine cities, they had as a guilt offering to Jehovah God. They had made five golden rats and five golden tumors. And that was their offering to God. (laughs) And they said, hey, here's the ark. Here's the golden rats. Here's the golden tumors. And please keep God in your own territory. (laughs) You say, wow, I bet the Israelites were just so fired up to have the ark and God back amongst them. Verse 19. But God struck down some of the men of Beth Shemesh, putting 70 of them to death because they looked into the ark of the Lord. The people mourned because of the heavy blow the Lord had dealt them. And the men of Beth Shemesh asked, who can stand in the presence of the Lord, this holy God, to whom will the ark go up from here? You know, I don't know all of what happened that day, but I'm thankful I got to watch the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark. You remember when the Nazis opened up the Lost Ark? They go, oh, oh, wow. It was intense. Well, that whole scene comes from this particular passage. What was in the Ark? Well, according to Hebrews chapter 9, there were three things in the Ark. First of all, was Aaron's staff that budded. Secondly, was a golden jar of manna. And thirdly, were the very stone tablets of the Ten Commandments. Now, come on. Wouldn't you been curious to look on in there? (laughs) When you think about it, curiosity is a quality which perpetuates the greatness of man and also destroys him. When you think about sin, often sin begins with curiosity. Lust. Pornography, internet pornography, masturbation. It all begins with curiosity. Drugs, marijuana, all the way to heroin. Begins with curiosity. I wonder what it would be like. I wonder if I could be happier. Materialism begins with curiosity. I'm just going to go window shopping. And then you hear that couch calling your name. You hear that suit calling your name. You hear those shoes calling your name. Curiosity. God is God. God is God amongst those that are non-believers. The Philistines. And God is the same God. Amongst those who are believers, the Israelites. And right here, God hated the sin. Now, God loved the people. But God hated the sin of the non-believers. But he hated the sin of the believers. You know, very often, in studying with people, There's one particular cost that weighs on them before they can be baptized. This past week, I was studying with two such individuals. 
I was talking to one young man, and he says, listen, I just cannot stop my lust. I just can't do it. It's plagued me my entire life. I can't do it. I said, no, that's, that's not right. Lust, pornography is your idol. It's not that you can't stop it. It's that you won't stop it. You love it more than God. And bottom line, your problem is you have no fear of God. He says, well, I want to be a Christian. I said, you have no fear of God. He says, we can't even talk about you becoming a Christian until the fear of God comes into your life. And I said, here, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get out of concordance or go on the Internet and you look up in the Bible the passages on the fear of God. Now, unbeknownst to this young man, there are literally hundreds of them. Well, after a couple of days, we got back together. He goes, wow, there are a lot of passages on the fear of God. The fear of God stops you from doing everything that's evil. I said, exactly. How's your purity been? It's been awesome. It's been awesome. When we have the fear of God, we are not going to love sin. Are you with me here, church? The trials dark on every hand and we cannot understand. Sometimes we don't want to understand. Because we want to keep our lives the way we want them. And not being sold out to God. As a people, God wanted the Israelites to obey him. And obedience begins with the fear of God that leads to an appreciation that leads to the love of God. Amen? Second point. We wonder why the test when we try to do our best. You ever felt that way about your life? Why is this going on? I am trying so hard as a disciple. Well, let's go on to chapter 7. The ark of God is moved to carry out the Jerim. That's the only place that would take it. And the Bible says it sits there for 20 years. You know, it's amazing. How long can we sit there and do nothing about God? Let's see what happens. Verse 2. It was a long time. Twenty years in all that the ark remained at Kiriath Jerem. And all the people of Israel mourned and sought after the Lord. And Samuel said to the whole house of Israel, If you're returning to the Lord with all your hearts, then rid yourselves of the foreign gods and the asterisks and commit yourself to the Lord and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the Israelites put away their veils and asterisks and served the Lord only. It's amazing right here. The call of God is the same from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation. God wants us to turn our hearts to Him and to love Him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's what God wanted in the time of Samuel, and that's what God wants today. And He will accept nothing else. See, God is the same yesterday, today, And forever. Amen. Amen. And of that is our surety and our hope. Now, right here, we find that when the people of God collectively turn to God and and become devoted to him again, Samuel's able to unify him. You know, you're never going to be able to unify your Bible talk. You're never going to be able to unify your house church. You're never going to be able to unify a congregation. You're never going to be able to unify our family of churches until you get everybody to seek after God with with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength. So often we want to go after unity when the issue is we got to go after God. When you get everybody focused in on being sold out for God, then and only then are you going to have true unity. You know, very interesting. When Samuel sees all of Israel turning to God, he tells them to leave all the bales and asterisks they do. And there is this sense of unity that starts to come upon them. And so now Samuel senses the time is right to throw off 
the Philistine rule. And so he begins to make sacrifice. And we read in verse 10. While Samuel was sacrificing the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to engage the Israelites in battle. You know, when you start turning to the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, there's going to be an enemy that begins to oppose you. Are you with me right here? You start studying the Bible, let me tell you something. There's going to be an enemy that starts opposing you. You start living your life as a baptized disciple, there are going to be enemies that start opposing you. Right here, when Israel got unified and turned totally to the Lord, that's when the Philistines rose back on up and were about to go to battle. But Samuel's offering a sacrifice to God, and we read this. But that day the Lord thundered with a loud thunder against the Philistines and threw them into such a panic that they were routed before the Israelites. The men of Israel rushed out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines, slaughtering them along the way to the point below beth Then Samuel took a stone and set up between Mizpah and Shen. He named it Ebenezer, saying, Thus far, the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued and did not invade the Israelite territory again. Right here we find that Israel comes together before God. They have a spiritual leader. And then, without raising a sword, the Lord thunders from heaven Sends the Philistines into a panic. I mean, I'm sure they were thinking, "Uh uh-oh, 20 years ago, the Ark of God. And they're just sent into a panic. And then the Israelites just kind of mop up. And they totally defeat the Philistines. Is that incredible? And now we see how God worked through the righteous distress of Hannah to raise up this new judge, Samuel, who now not only is the spiritual leader of Israel, but he's now become the civil leader of Israel and, surprisingly, the military leader of Israel. And up to this record, we have no other record of him leading anybody in the battle. Is that incredible? So we find that now Israel is led by the man that God has chosen in all three areas right there. Isn't that interesting? And so Samuel goes, listen, the credit isn't for me. The credit is to God. And so he sets up this Ebenezer. And all that Ebenezer means literally is stone of help. He says, I want us to always remember why we threw off the Philistines. It was that God has helped us thus far. Is that awesome, church? Read on right here. Throughout the life time of Samuel, the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines. The town of Ekron to Gath that the Philistines had captured from Israel were restored to her, and Israel delivered the neighboring territory from the power of the Philistines. And there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. Samuel continued as judge over Israel all the days of his life. I mean, you got to admit, this is the good times for Samuel, isn't it? And it is good to have some good times. Amen, church? You got to enjoy those times. Well, Let's go to chapter 8. Sometimes good times only last a chapter. Verse 1. When Samuel grew old. Some of us are approaching that point. When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as judges for Israel. The name of the firstborn was Joel, and the name of the second was Abijah. And they served at Bathsheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. And they said to him, you're old and your sons are not walking your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us such as all the other nations have. Right here we find in the midst of all of the awesomeness of God and the awesomeness of Israel finally throwing off Philistine rule. Samuel himself experiences an incredible disappointment. He wanted his sons to be judges to follow him in Israel. But the Bible quite clearly says right here, they turned aside and went after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. And we know from Exodus chapter 23, verse 8, that that is expressly forbidden in the word of God. The leaders of God are to be integrable and honest, and nothing less can be accepted. Amen? Amen. But one has to ask the question, well, now hold it. The guy that Samuel just replaced, Eli, his sons were evil, and the Lord killed them. 
and killed Eli. Is there a difference? And we have to say, now hold it, there's got to be consistency here. Because it's the same book with the same author. So what is the difference? I think it's quite fundamentally this. Samuel himself stayed righteous before God. Samuel never condoned the life that his sons led. Now, it must have given him immense heartbreak because any of us that have had family members leave the Lord, I mean, the pain is always with you. You know what I'm talking about right here, guys? And yet Samuel kept his spiritual bearings. Very often when a family member or a close friend of ours departs the Lord, we can become sentimental. We, we can become soft. We can become tolerating of sin, tolerating of false doctrine. That is not where Samuel went. Samuel stayed strong. Samuel stayed true, even in the midst of... Of this terrible and horrific time in his life. Secondly, what began to happen is that the, some of the leaders began to turn on him. And said, well, Samuel, we don't want you to lead us. Now, you got to remember, Samuel at this point is a spiritual leader. He is the civil leader. And he is the military leader. And God had wanted one man to lead. That was the plan of God. And they say, No. Since your sons are going the wrong way, we want you to give us a king like all the other nations. Now, that doesn't even sound good, does it? You know, uh, we, we need to understand a basic principle of God. And this becomes more evident as we read in verse 18. We find that Samuel lays out that, hey, if you get a king, that's not good. And so we read in verse 6. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing it to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will do. Now this is an incredible passage that I think for a lot of Christians, they don't fully understand this side of God. God was against setting up a king. Because the purpose of the king was simply to lead the people in a civil and military way. And so you would have a divided leadership. You'd have spiritual leadership and you'd have the civil and military leadership, which, of course, is how Israel goes for the next few centuries. Amen? God's plan was one. Now, right here, though, we see something with God that we need to really grasp. God is totally against a king, but he permits it. We need to understand that God permits things in our lives that he doesn't necessarily approve of. Sometimes we have no, quote, spiritual discipline placed on us through the events of our lives. And we think, well, it must be okay then. And so we assume approval when in actuality God is only permitting and he in fact disapproves. Case in point, divorce in the Old Testament. Moses said, all you have to do to divorce a woman is just give her a piece of paper and say, woman, I don't like you. We're divorced. That's how it was then. Jesus says, listen, that's just not going down. The only reason God accepts divorce is because of adultery. And so God permitted a divorce because a guy just didn't like a woman. But God did not approve. Of that. Are you with me right here? And we've got to really see that God allows people to go on their way. And you say, why does he do it? Well, you know the answer. The headstrong must learn from experience. Have you been there? Come heck or high water, you're going to do it anyway. And God says, okay. Go ahead. 
and you will see what's going to happen. But God allows that, and we need to understand that is how God works in people's lives. You know, what a sad time for Samuel. I mean, it's incredible. Here he was, the religious leader, the civil leader, the military leader. His boys have gone the wrong direction. The people don't want him to lead anymore. And then God says, listen, I I want you to make sure the people do get a king, but you warn them. Verse 18. When the day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen, and the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we'll be like all the other nations, with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. When Samuel heard all the people said, he repeated it before the Lord. The Lord answered, listen to them and give them a king. Then Samuel said to the men of Israel, everyone go back to his hometown. You know, so often, we're just like the Israelites. We want to be just like all the other nations. You know, of course, the most common area that is is in the area of dress. You know, we, we want to wear the right label. We want to have the right look. We want to look the most modern. We don't want to stick out. We want to be cool. We want to be accepted. We want to be just like everybody else. And those of you that raise children, that's the cry. Well, so-and-so gets to stay up past midnight. Well, so-and-so gets to drive the car. Well, so-and-so gets to do this and that. And that becomes the justification For your evil desires. So you understand that as a parent. And God is our father. But when we, his spiritual children, go behold it, everybody else is like that in the world. And so what happens then is those of us that become disciples, we look at other people in the world. And we not only want to be like them, we become jealous of them. And we want to go back to the old life. It's like the Israelites. Well, we had it so good in Egypt. No, you didn't. You've totally forgotten how lousy it was. The slavery, the bondage, the whips. But those of us that are disciples, and we start turning back from the Lord. Because we want to be like other nations. We start thinking the old life was good. You have totally forgotten the emptiness of the old life. You know, it occurs to me, as the Israelites were the people of God, so God's churches are. You know, sometimes even in this congregation, we had a pretty challenging message at our congregational devotional on Friday night, didn't we? Amen. And sometimes we want to say, well, we want to be like all the other churches. We don't want to be the church of the Bible. We want to be like all these other churches. They don't have so many meetings. They don't have so many expectations. They don't have so many calls to purity. They don't have any lines about who you're going to date. And we want to be just like all the other churches. And we say, in the name of freedom. I want to talk. I want to talk to the parents in the group. In raising your children, what would have happened if you didn't have any expectations or any sense of control? It's scary, isn't it? (laughs) You know, in a family, we have great dreams for our children and we have expectations. We try to help them meet and have their own dreams. But you expect them at dinner. At least I do. You expect them to behave. You expect them to obey. You expect them to lead a godly life. We're an imperfect human parent. How much more does our Father in heaven have expectations of us to obey the Word of God? Amen? Amen. But see, a lot of people want to use a worldly term. They say, well, I don't want to be controlled. little buzzword right there. And we're Americans. We love freedom. We don't want any control. See, that, that, that word is so twisted. It's not, it's not a matter of control. It's a matter of protecting you from harm. 
When your parents say, listen, I don't want you crossing the street. It's dangerous. They're not trying to control your life so you can't experience the fun of the highway. <laughs> they're saying, don't cross the street because they're concerned about you because you're going to harm your life and you may, in fact, lose it. So is discipling. Discipling is where we speak the words of God to one another. Now, at the end of the day, as with the way of God, you're going to do what you want to do. But if we truly love one another, we're going to speak the truth in love and try to help each other. A rebellious, ungodly view is you're trying to control my life. No, we're not. We're trying to help you live a godly life. Now, if you want to be rebellious and you don't want to live up to the expectations of the word of God, amen. And then you can have a church like all the other churches where there's immorality in the youth group, where there's adultery and unhappiness in the marriages, where there's divorce inside the church at the same rate that's in the world, that means that there's no difference from the world than from the church. Now, let me tell you something. We all individually have got to make this decision to be the church of the Bible. And yes, the Bible has expectations like encouraging each other every day. Yes, the Bible has expectations about not neglecting to meet together. And yeah, I, I, at, at the end of the day, you can blow off congregational devotional. You can blow off Bible talk. And you're permitted by God to do that. But you will suffer the consequences. Not from humans, but from God. And we have got to start looking at things spiritually and saying, hold it. I love God. And because I love God as my father and I trust him, I may not always understand why he commands everything in here. But I am going to do my best to do it. Amen? Amen. And when we do that, God bless us. You know, 16 short months ago, our church was just a cauldron of bitterness and hate and divisions and factions. It was a sad moment. And I, I really believe God was terribly upset and terribly sad. But it's amazing to me when we all decide, listen, we need to be called by God back to total commitment, back to loving the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. When we all started coming back together and then we had that evening of atonement. I mean, it was awesome. I mean, that night, we rebuilt the base, the foundation of the church. And I don't know about you, I was so encouraged Friday night when the emails were read from the other churches that had been going through all sorts of heck. And they said, listen, we see what's happened in Portland and it's awesome. And so Montreal, Canada says, listen, we need an evening of atonement. And it was awesome. The brothers and sisters there are apologizing to the Lord, apologizing to each other. And there is now unity in that church. Is that awesome? I mean, it's awesome what's happening in Worcester, Massachusetts. I mean, the same thing. Tears over the sin that they had committed. And when we own our own sin and turn to God and other people do the same, then we can have true unity. Are you with me here, church? On the other hand, we find at this time that Israel is permitted to have a king. It's kind of sad. We wonder why the test we tried to our best. Samuel was trying so hard, and yet the disappointments were there. But the thing that was awesome about Samuel is that he never quit. Let's go to our third point. We will understand it better by and by. Let's go to chapter 9. There's a Benjamite, a man of standing whose name was Kish. He had a son named Saul, an impressive young man without equal amongst the Israelites, a head taller than any of the others. I mean, this guy was huge. You couldn't miss Saul in a crowd. He was a big man. You know, you'd look out over the crowd, and there 
would be Saul. I mean, you go, he's the man, absolutely. He was bigger than anybody else. Of course, it, it kind of gives a new slant for what we're going to be studying in the future about Goliath, doesn't it? That this was Israel's physical Goliath. But that's next week. <laughs> Verse 3. Now the donkeys belonging to Saul's father, Kish, were lost. And Kish said to his son, Saul, take one of the servants with you and go and look for the donkeys. Now, you're probably asking yourself, so the Lord spent a whole verse of scripture talking about lost donkeys. You know, it's incredible to me that the insignificant and the seemingly random have a great impact on the eternal purposes of God. Are you saying that looking for lost donkeys is going to change the course of human events? Absolutely. Let's read on. Verse 4. So he passed through the hill country of Ephraim and through the area around Shalasha, but they didn't find him. They went into the district of Shalom, but the donkeys were not there. Then he passed through the territory of Benjamin, but they didn't find him. When they reached the district of Zuf, Saul said to the servant who was with them, Come, let's go back, or my father will stop thinking about the donkeys and stop worrying about us. But the servant replied, Look, in this town there's a man of God. He's highly respected, and everything he says comes true. Let's go there now. Perhaps he'll tell us, which way to take? So Saul said to his servant, If we go, what can we give the man? The food in our sacks is gone. We have no gift to take to the man of God. What do we have? The servant answered him again. Look, he said, I have a quarter of a shekel of silver. I'll give it to the man of God so he'll tell us which way to take. Formerly in Israel, if a man went to inquire of God, he would say, Come, let's go to the seer. Because the prophet of today used to be called a seer. Good, Saul said to the servant. Come, let's go. So they set out for the town where the man of God was. As they were going up the hill to the town, they met some girls coming out to draw water. And they asked them, is the seer here? He is, they answered. He's ahead of you. Hurry now. He's just come to our town today for the people have a sacrifice at the high place. As soon as you enter the town, you will find him before he goes up to the high place to eat. The people will not begin eating until he comes because he must bless the sacrifice. Afterward, those who are invited will eat. Go up now. You should find him about this time. They went up to the town, and as they were entering it, there was Samuel coming towards them on his way up to the high place. Now the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed this to Samuel. About this time tomorrow, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin. Anoint him leader over my people Israel. He will deliver my people from the hand of the Philistines. I have looked upon my people, for their cry has reached me. When Samuel caught sight of Saul, the Lord said to him, This is the man I spoke to you about. He will govern my people. That lost donkey was of God. Do you ever feel like your life could be summed up that you are looking for lost donkeys? There's a purpose behind it. How much more peaceful our lives would be if we were not worried about the things that we cannot control. How much more peaceful our lives would be if we would just simply accept that there's a sovereign God who either makes things happen or allows things to happen and we would stop being so doggone bitter about our lot in life. And just say, hold it. There is a reason that I live here. There's a reason for my color of skin. Yeah. Right. Amen. <laughs> There's a reason I'm stuck in a family of ten kids. <laughs> we look at our lot in life. There is a reason you're as poor as you are. There's a reason you're not smarter. There's a reason for the way your nose looks. Stop being bitter 
and accept the sovereignty of God. Saul obeyed his father's command for this seemingly stupid task of looking for donkeys. Have you ever felt that your job is stupid? At the end of the day, it really wasn't the donkeys, but God using the donkeys. Because the donkeys wandered in such a direction as to make Saul and his servant wonder, where are they? And then the servant remembered the man of God, Samuel. And once more, we see his integrity spoken of right here. And so they said, We've, we must go and see the man of God about the donkeys. And so they asked the girls. So, oh, the man of God is coming. He always comes right about here, right about this time. Old Samuel, he's very dependable because he goes on up to the high place. And there he offers sacrifices. He blesses it. And he invites whoever he wants to come and eat with him. It's kind of awesome. I think Samuel should be coming along and... Sure enough, as Saul and his servant went on their way, they saw Samuel. And they thought, awesome, we see Samuel. And now we will understand where the donkeys are. <laughs> but Samuel saw them. And he remembered that the day before, God has said, I will send a Benjamite to you. And he will be my anointed leader, the first king of Israel. But he looked at them and he kind of saw his donkeys. Sometimes we can be donkeys, can't we? And not understand all that God has in mind. We think that we're looking for the donkeys and we are the donkeys. You know, the Bible says in Acts 17, 26, that God appoints the exact places and times that we should live. He did this for a fundamental reason, that we would seek Him, reach out for Him, and find Him. Now, I believe that Scripture applies to people that are non-Christians, but I also believe it's for us Christians. It's not by chance you're in Portland. It's not by chance you're in this church. You're here and you're in this place, so that you will seek God, you will reach out for Him, and you will find Him. Does that encourage you, church? You know, after Samuel sees Saul, he invites them up. They have dinner. And then we read at the end of chapter 9, in verse 27. As they were going down to the edge of the town, Samuel said to Saul, Tell the servant to go on ahead of us. And the servant did so. But you stay here a while, so that I may give you a message from God. Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on Saul's head and kissed him, saying, has not the Lord anointed you leader over his inheritance? Wow. He says, you are going to be king. Now, you've got to understand, Israel never had a king. You are going to be the Lord's anointed. And he anoints him secretly in this first time. So that Saul would know. That he's the Lord's anointed. See, so often we do not understand or believe that God has a destiny for us. We're just looking for our donkeys. That's it. You know, I really love that scripture and I think our congregation does. And I know our first principal class is going to know this by Wednesday night. <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 29, 11. Amen. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. God had a plan for Samuel. God had a plan for Saul. Samuel always had that sense that he was of God. But Saul was not naturally spiritual, and he didn't have that sense of destiny. But once he starts hanging around Samuel, 
he begins to sense that God has a plan. Not to harm him, but to prosper him. That God indeed had a great destiny. We'll understand it better by and by. I remember many, many, many years ago, many years ago, I was a, I was a college student. And uh, I went to University of Florida back in 1971 as a freshman. And uh, in 1971, University of Florida was rated by Playboy magazine as the number one party school in the nation. Now, don't ask me how I know that. Now, I call myself a Christian, and there were some good intentions inside of me. But I really deceived myself. So one of the things I set about doing was to find a fraternity. I mean, after all, I was a Christian, but I wanted to be like, all the other nations, all the other cool guys. And so I went around, and at the beginning of the year, you go around and you rush the fraternities, and you pick the ones you like, and they hopefully pick you back and give you what's called a bid. And so I got bids from the four fraternities that I like the best, Lambda Chi, SAE, ATO, and Sigma Chi. And... Sigma Chi was one that I knew I was not going to pledge because my grandpa was a Sigma Chi, my dad was a Sigma Chi, and that meant these guys were forced to let me into fraternity. It was not a sign of my coolness. They had to let me in. So I just said, listen, I'm, I'm not going Sigma Chi. I'm glad I got the bid. Amen. That makes me feel awesome. And after a few days, I said, you know, the one I'm going to go to is ATO. And so I remember going to the ATO house, and the ATO house was such a cool house. It's this beautiful, large, white, giant house with pillars in front of it. And it was so cool. All the rooms were cool. And I remember going in that day. I can remember it. It's not just a memory. It's video. I remember walking in, and I, and I remember, this is going to be where I live. These are going to be my fraternity brothers. And I'm going to be just like them. I remember going up the second floor and talking to the guy. It was kind of a sign to me. And we talked and I just had, you ever get this sense going, no, nah, this isn't the right spot. I started talking to him and I wanted to say, hey, I want to pledge ATO. This is the place I want to be for the next four years. But something Something kept saying, this is not the right spot. And I sat there uncomfortable. And I got sad. Because I wanted this to be the right spot. But something said, it wasn't the right spot. And so I didn't say anything. I got up. And I walked out. And it just hit me. I said, you know something? Those are not the guys that I really want to be like. I like the guys at Sigma Chi. And I walked all the way across campus. The campus is a couple miles. And I walked into the Sigma Chi house, saw the guy that was supposed to be on me, my big brother. I said, listen, I want to be a Sigma Chi. He said, awesome. So I pledged Sigma Chi. Now at this particular point, like a lot of other freshmen, I was naive only to some degree. And God permitted me to get into sin. I started drinking. I started messing around with girls. I fell into petting for the first time the night I was initiated into fraternity. And I called myself a Christian. And at that point, no one said anything to me. And then, after being totally embarrassed, because Monday after the initiation party, I was voted the Hot and Nasty Award. And I was supposed to be the Christian. And I'm winning the hot and nasty award. I got hickeys on my neck. I'm going, oh my gosh. Literally, two weeks later, this fraternity brother walks on up to me and says, hey, I want to invite you to a Bible study. I want to invite you to church. I never met him before. His name was Sam, like in Samuel. 
And it turns out he, he had graduated, but he was still living at the house, and it was why I hadn't really met him. But I remember then, because my life was such a mess, and I knew it was a mess. You ever get that point where, I mean, you, you are just a mess, and you know you're a mess? I said, listen, I need to find a new church. And so I went with them, and I go, wow, these people are awesome. And at first, I, I went to the church, and I saw their commitment in the campus group, and I saw their zeal, and I said, oh, good, I'll just join this church. But as I hung around a little bit further, I said, hold it. These guys are really happy, and I don't have that happiness. These guys are really committed, and I've never been that committed. And then they sat down, studied the scriptures with me, and I saw that never become a true Christian. And April 11, 1972, 1.30 in the morning, I was baptized in the Christ. Amen? <laughs> I did not know until that time then all the fraternities at the University of Florida, and there were 28. There was only one fraternity that had a Bible study of disciples, Sigma Chi. You see, something was going on when I was over there at the ATO house. I wasn't spiritually in touch enough to know that it was the Holy Spirit talking to my heart saying, No, don't do this. Have you ever been there? You just know, hold it. This doesn't feel right. This isn't the right direction. And you follow your heart, the Spirit. And so I pledged Sigma Chi, the one I had said I wasn't going to. You know, when you say something to God, that's the one I'm not doing, that's where you're going. <laughs> and you know, it's amazing. God did not send a disciple in my life when I first got to the Sigma Chi house. I wasn't ready yet. I was still prideful in my Christianity. He had to permit me to sin against the blood of Jesus. I had to, I had to fall on my face and be so distressed and disgusted with my sin that I would be open to going to another church. You know, I clearly see the hand of God in my conversion. But you know, I know that God loves every single person equally as much. That God is trying to work in your life if you're not a Christian. And he's trying to orchestrate events. And sometimes he's saying, you don't do this. And other times saying, yes, you better get up and go. But God is at work. And, you know, as Christians, we say, oh, yeah, I see God working in these non-Christians. This is really awesome. Well, hey, he's working in your life, too. Amen. And, and we've got to get a deep conviction that we need to follow the word of God and obey it. We may not understand every element in it, but someday we'll understand it by and by. You know, as we read right here, Saul is anointed. And so on earth, two guys knew that Saul was to be the first king of Israel. Samuel and Saul. And his destiny begins to unfold. Next week, we'll find out what that destiny is. Thank you and God bless.